It's good to see you again. <laughs> Same here. How was that? How was how spicy was that chicken for real? <laughs> you were beginning to sweat. I think you were. Uh, you had to blow your nose at one point. No, not not that bad. You'd handle your spice though. Yeah. I think so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't you uh, do me a favor? Let's start by introducing yourself again, sir. Peter Gross, electrical engineer. That's the most important thing about me. Spent my entire career uh, in the uh, uh, digital infrastructure space. Started designing uh, power electronic systems, uh, first for the Fusion, United States Fusion program. That was really exciting in the early 80s. And then... Uh, um, and then uh, from there, I started uh, designing uh, UPS systems uh, that introduced me to data centers, this magical thing called da data centers. Uh, uh, I started uh, I working in a small consulting firm. We did a lot of work for the big financial institution in New York and banks. Uh, fascinating time. Um, it was, uh, you know, all these all these financial institutions depend so heavily on on uh, IT and computers in particular uh, that uh, and everybody thought that uh, that uh, data centers are an art rather than a, a science, and uh, there is uh, something magical about it. <coughs> um, anyway, it was uh, it was an interesting time, and then uh, and after a number of years. I started my own uh, engineering firm, consulting engineering firm, totally dedicated to the data center business. Uh, that was right, right before the dot com uh, kind of <coughs> sense is going to come. Uh, and uh, <coughs> my company was um, was really involved in that uh, whole uh, crazy construction time. Uh, probably we probably designed and helped build uh, uh, at least 30, 40 percent of all the dot com data centers. And uh, and then we survived the uh, uh, nuclear winter of uh, of the dot com by uh, by coming back to our traditional base of uh, uh, financial institution and bank customers, and then when the business started to come back, we are again very well positioned to uh, support uh, the uh, the growth of the of the data center. So um, it, uh, um, it grew to be the largest engineering consulting firm of this type around in the world. Uh, we had office all over the country and uh, many places around the world. We built a lot of the big data centers uh, uh, that are still running today. And then uh, um, and then I sold my company to Hewlett Packard. Um, and uh, for four years, I served as uh, the managing partner of a consulting business, still uh, focusing primarily on uh, uh, data centers, and uh, but also starting to get involved with with energy issues and and sustainability. That was the early days of uh, of uh, um, energy efficiency concerns and uh, and uh, carbon reduction. Um, uh, and my next step was. Uh, um, a company called Bloom Energy, the largest manufacturer of solid oxide fuel cells, uh, that um, um, is uh, is the premier provider of uh, um, of uh, these devices, um, uh, chemical devices that convert uh, hydrogen and oxygen into electricity. Um, I ran a business unit that uh, that used these devices, these uh, fuel cells, in uh, in mission critical application data centers, uh, we built the first uh, large data centers supplied uh, by uh, fuel cells for eBay in um, Salt Lake City. Um, and uh, since then, uh, there are a lot of uh, other data centers around the world that uh, use uh, uh, fuel cells. And now, for the last uh, few years, uh, last four years or so, I've been uh, I've been still. Uh, Working in this space, uh, I guess uh, once you get in, there is no way to get out. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm still passionate about this uh, this business. That uh, passionate about uh, uh, innovation, about new things, uh, um, and especially the fact that uh, uh, this uh, this business has evolved to the point where it's uh, extraordinarily extraordinarily dynamic now. Um, 
So uh, I'm a consultant. I was a number of companies. I sit on uh, a number of boards. I'm an advisor to a number of companies. I I speak quite a bit around the world at uh, various conferences. Um, and what keeps me engaged in this uh, in this industry in this business is is the fact that uh, it's evolving so rapidly. That it's, uh, there is so much uh, new stuff happening, so much innovation, and uh, and also the fact that uh, I I build this uh, this relationship with uh, uh, so many people like you. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> It's difficult to abandon your friends, uh, uh, so uh, <coughs> uh, I uh, uh, I I feel excited every day uh, uh, um, doing work and uh, and learning more about uh, uh, about this industry. And uh, now with uh, with uh, the way this uh, this business has evolved from uh, from the traditional enterprise data centers moving to uh, um, Collocation, um, cloud, uh, and uh, um, and now into AI data centers, uh, you see so much, so much innovation, such a dramatic transformation of uh, of this uh, of this industry that um, it's uh, it's really exciting. Wow. Well, listen, let me unpackage some of that for those that are maybe either listening to the podcast for the first time and they don't even know who I am. For those of you that are listening. Um, Peter's one of the biggest luminaries in this industry. And uh, I I challenge anybody to come up and, and, and challenge that. The other part would be um, you're one of the pioneers of this industry, right? And it's an honor and a privilege to be able to sit down and talk with you. I remember standing in line. I, I was telling someone, uh, first time I saw you, it was at a DCD in New York, uh, you know, 12, 15 years ago. And there was literally a line for an hour long to wait to shake your hand. And then I, uh, I, got sick of waiting in line and I went right to the bathroom. It turns out that you had to go to the bathroom too. And next thing you know, you were standing right next to me and we were talking. <laughs> so, and we've been friends since then. I've, I've uh, spent a great amount of time. I want the rest of the industry to understand, you know, we're living in, uh, if this was the automotive industry, we're still living in the times in which the Henry Fords of our generation are still among us. Uh -huh. And I count you and Christian and some of the other guys that roll in that orbit with you guys. And there's a very small pocket of you that pioneered this industry together. And, and I think that you guys are all, you know, very good at giving the others the credit for certain things. But together, you guys were all pioneering this industry that's 25 years old, yeah, right? Yeah, and, right? And right. And I try to explain it to people that uh, are just getting into the game for the first year, first two, three, four, five years. Um, there were no bigger names when I was getting into this space than with you guys, you and Christian and guys like that. And, and the, you know, I want those that are listening to realize those that build an industry, that sunset into that industry, become those that create policy for industry, right? You pioneers that generated it are gonna allow as we continue, you're gonna guide us as we evolve into a mainstream industry. This is not a mainstream industry yet, do you agree? Not yet, yeah. <laughs> but it will be soon. I believe this is a year of a tipping point. And, and to get us into that part of maturity, you know, we've talked about a lot of things that an industry has to do before it arrives there. Um, from our perspective, because of the things that we do with technology and what you're gonna talk about today, I hope is on power and how, how dependent upon power this entire world is at the economic level, let alone the data center side. But um, this is a topic that we need to bring more attention to. I don't think there's anything more important in this industry than this topic right now. Do you agree? I totally agree. I totally agree. And, you know, <laughs> was, uh, was the risk of, uh, of sounding a little bit melodramatic, um, I still <clears throat> dare to say that uh, we are, we are experiencing a, um, a great risk to our economy to our way of life uh because of because of uh what you call power, power. power and energy and, it's, and we uh, have been in that situation for a long time but what's putting us into a corner right now is ai right yes yeah but it's not only ai if you if you look around uh, all the manufacturing this is that's coming back to united states obviously the ev industry and all the charging stations that are using enormous amount of of power also uh and, and also the in the ai but the numbers are staggering absolutely staggering if you look at uh, uh the projections uh, you know only a year or two years ago uh the great uh, growth for um, 
the, the grid uh, projection uh, were maybe two and a half percent or so. And in 2023, it jumped to a growth rate of 4.7 percent. I mean, more than double. I mean, these 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 numbers are staggering. I mean, it's a uh, um, we are experiencing uh, power shortages in so many regions around the country and around the world, for that matter. It's not only this is not unique to our country, but uh, there are so many places around around Europe. Uh, around Asia, um, there are moratoriums uh, um, prohibiting the construction of new data centers simply because their uh, um, municipalities, cities, countries are concerned that uh, that uh, uh, this enormous power demand growth will jeopardize the ability to give some examples. We know Virginia, Northern Virginia, has started doing a clawback. Ireland <laughs> shut down as a country. What, I mean, we're yeah. seeing this all over the world right now, right? Yeah, uh, Ireland is a great destination. Uh, yeah, there is no, there is no real power, uh, but uh, but uh, um, you know, there is a lot of on-site generation and distributed generation. But but there are shortages in uh, in Frankfurt and in Paris and in London and in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, um, it's uh, <laughs> there are. Europe is is running short of uh, of uh, uh, locations. Uh, you know, you see now data centers. A lot of data centers being built in Spain, uh, for instance, and nobody built data centers uh, uh, ten years ago in Spain. Uh, and these countries, this exactly the same. Uh, there is, uh, you know, it's it's interesting that um, there are. Um, Approximately last year, there were 2,000 applications for interconnects. Just in the United States? Just in the United States. And the average the average uh, response uh, from the utility was that, uh, that it's going to take up to five years for, for this interconnection to be made. So break that down so that others understand that's the acceptance of a new substation to generate and transmit power to be plugged into the grid. That's right. Is a five-year wait. It's a five-year wait or longer, um, and uh, it's it's not necessarily a generation issue. It's more or more of a transmission, transmission distribution, uh, transmission and distribution system uh, issue. But uh, but obviously AI and data center in general have made an enormous contribution to this situation. Um, you know, some numbers are incredible. Uh, uh, the total demand for uh, data centers uh, was estimated uh, uh, in 2022 to be about between 400 to 460 terawatt hours. And it's projected that uh, uh, 2024 is going to be over a thousand, so more than double. Uh, you know, um, McKenzie came came out and they 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 projected that uh, the uh, the total demand will go from about 17 gigawatts to 35 gigawatts in between now and 2026. I mean, that's only two and a half years. So, can they reach that level of capacity demand? in the current state that we're in right now. Well, uh, <laughs> so I want to pause because this is the part of the podcast where I want people to start paying attention that these are podcasts. Some are here to entertain and some are here to educate and some are here to inspire. This is a podcast that if you're in this industry right now, it doesn't matter if you're low voltage structured cabling, if you're a superintendent on a construction site, working for a subcontractor, or if you're in the equipment side or equipment rental side, it does not matter. This affects all of us. And it and right. it and even if you double tap on that and zoom out even further, this is a topic that's going to impact us professionally and personally. Probably us more professionally than others because we sit at the bottom end of the demand of power for data centers, right? So right. to that end, I want people to lean in and start really giving this an opportunity to learn, and and throw out some of the staggering numbers that you throw out sometimes when we talk about, you know, the infrastructure. How what's the age of our infrastructure when it comes to the grid? You know what. If we have these trends of pent up demand for more power, is it even tenable to put more of the current solution that we offer on the line? Or do we need to have a really meaningful, sustainable shift? Right. Yeah, if you look, you're absolutely right. If you look at the aging of the grid, you know, the, the electrical grid is considered the largest 
the greatest engineering uh, achievement of the 20th century. Uh, and in, indeed, it's an extraordinary, an extraordinary uh, accomplishment, but, but it's aging. Um, um, if you look at the number of significant power and uh, power failures that occurred between uh, 1980 and uh, uh, 2016, I believe, there are there less than eight. A, a major failure is considered a million people for an hour or a uh, hundred thousand people for uh, for 10 hours being affected. Uh, since then, we had north of uh, 60 events, and th that's caused by a uh, a variety of factors, whether it's uh, climate change, we have all these uh, uh, black swans, we had uh, Katrina, and uh, we, we had uh, the freeze in Texas. We have all these, these uh, events that uh, contribute to that. In addition, um, the for a variety of reasons, primarily aging, between uh, now and 2030, uh, um, approximately uh, 40 gigawatts worth of capacity of generation will be will be taken out of service. Some of them are nuclear power plants, some of them are coal power plants, but and the projection is uh, that only between 15 and 30 gigawatts will be will replace these uh, these out of commission uh, uh, generation plants. So we're gonna we're gonna have a shortage there, and then it can take into account. Uh, uh, things like um, the threats of uh, uh, cyber attacks, uh, which are becoming, uh, becoming a major concern. Also, ironically, uh, <laughs> ironically, the the proliferation of renewable also uh, creates some instability in the in the grid. The fact that that uh, we have these large uh, chunks of power uh, being added or remove it, removed from, from the grid creates instability as long, be and that's because we still don't have storage. We, don't, we have very little storage associated with these. There's a lot of progress there, and we're going to talk, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about uh, the whole storage story, but, uh, but unless we, we, we add a lot more storage capacity in our system we're gonna uh, we're gonna suffer from uh, from uh, the instability and the uh, intermittence of uh, of wind and solar um, so there are there are all these factors uh, that uh, that make the future of uh, our energy uh, uh, situation uh, um, risky and uh, of great concern. Um, now, um, if you look at um, uh, what AI is doing to this industry. By the way, do you need something to drink? Didn't open that. No, I'm good. I'm okay. Fine. Uh, I'm fine. Um, as you as you probably know, um, there are essentially essentially two kinds of uh, AI data centers. One is called the learning data center, the training data centers that uh, uh, were uh, all these uh, uh, hundreds of billions of uh, pieces of information uh, are um, um, are used to uh, train the machines. And these type of data centers uh, um, are very large. They, t they take enormous amount of, uh, of power. Uh, you're looking at uh, hundreds of megawatts uh, worth of uh, capacity. The learning ones are hundreds of megawatts? Hun hundreds of megawatts. Do we have any idea how many of those exist today, probably? Estimated uh, less than a dozen? No, l less than that. You know, uh, you need to understand that we are at the very early stage of this journey. Um, the whole AI is 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 is, uh, is just is just starting, and uh, you know, data center, especially data center of this size, will take a fairly long time to uh, to be developed, to be uh, you know, <laughs> finding the uh, finding the the space and the power and uh, uh, going through the whole. Permitting process, uh, um, solving all these uh, um, 
uh, supply chain issues that are uh, uh, really affecting this industry, whether it's, whether it's generators or or chillers or uh, or transformers or many other components. So that's another factor. Uh, shortage of labor. All these factors uh, uh, make uh, the whole process of building a data center uh, lengthy and and difficult. So uh, this is just starting, but. But coming back to uh, um, uh, to where to find power, so uh, because of this uh, this type of uh, AI data centers are latency insensitive, so they, um, la- latency is not critical, so they can be con- uh, located anywhere. So that's why uh, a lot of these are uh, going to Iowa or Alabama or. Iowa and uh, Alabama and uh, places like uh, you know. Uh, um, Ohio, uh, a lot of places where uh, uh, data centers were not right, uh, <laughs> uh, not a, a great, a very popular destination for data center in the past. But uh, um, but also to the Nordics, to Iceland, and to Norway, and uh, um, places like this. So uh, so these data centers a do not do not uh, um, require uh, a location that is uh, uh, close to uh, latency uh, issue to urban a- environments and uh, the reliability is not all that critical to a certain degree and I sure I think some people will probably be uh, upset about uh, this statement but uh, to a certain degree they 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 resemble uh, 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 crypto mining facilities uh, same thing they're uh, less reliable. Uh, Less you know, redundancy. Less, yeah, you know, the reliability is not as critical, right? And uh, the um, um, and also the fact that uh, they can be located anywhere in the world uh, 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 make it a little easier because everybody right now everybody is looking for power and everybody is looking for land and water and the ability and, to scale. That's right, scale and obviously. Uh, uh, cost of electricity is important, uh, um, considering how how expensive, how, what a big component of the operational cost electricity is, and the fact that uh, electricity costs are uh, uh, continually going up, and there is no end in sight. Especially considering uh, the the imbalance between demand and supply. Um, so, um, um, and also. Another another wrinkle to this uh, uh, situation is the fact that uh, uh, the majority of uh, of companies in this business are are um, very uh, committed to building carbon free, uh, low carbon, sustainable uh, data centers. Uh, you know there is a there is a great great reaction out in the world uh, uh, complain that uh, the data centers are are uh, generating too much co2 and uh, they, they are they are polluting our environments uh, that uh, diesel generators are creating the, uh, uh, unhealthy environments and so on so so uh, um, finding uh, large chunks of electricity and uh, large uh, uh, lands of power that is relatively inexpensive and uh, uh, either uh, close to um, to hydro or geothermal or uh, uh, close to large large um, solar or wind plants it's becoming very challenging. <coughs> On the other hand, uh, uh, the the other type of data centers, the uh, inference data centers, uh, are more like the traditional uh, cloud enterprise data centers, where reliability is critical, where latency is, is critical. So that means that uh, they have to be physically uh, close to large urban environments, uh, uh, and uh, that makes it a lot more difficult. They are they are. Uh, Smaller in size, uh, um, you know, a typical um, platform uh, uh, inference uh, um, cluster is maybe five to ten uh, uh, megawatts or so. Uh, you're going to have multiple uh, clusters like this in one building, or they're going to be what what is called federated uh, AI data centers, where where uh, you're going to have um, um, existing. Uh, um, um, enterprise data center being converted to AI, or uh, that's uh, called federated. Federated, yeah. It's um, you know you have federated and uh, sovereign da- AI data center, where uh, um, 
whether it's a bank or a financial institution or a healthcare enterprise or, or a uh, 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 food chain, um, they uh, these these uh, enterprises don't want to share their their data, their private information, their private data that uh, has been accumulated over the years. So they're going to build their own platform, their on prem, on prem, or or it could be or. Could very well be at uh, AWS or uh, at Google, or could be in uh, in a typical colocation facility, or it could be on prem uh, at uh, at an existing uh, converted uh, uh, enterprise data center. So, this is this this is still a very very dynamic environment. This uh, uh, there is still a lot of uncertainty. There is uncertainty uh, about uh, not only the power, but also about design, about uh, about the operations, about uh, uh, about um, <coughs> the delivery and the build of it itself. Not just design, but the ability to get the supply chain and the labor force right. aligned to be able to give it before That's you right. commission it and give it to ops. Yeah, so it's a very challenging. It's a very challenging environment. It's a very exciting environment. It's a very. It's a. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun uh, to uh, uh, to. To live through this this extraordinary transformational period, uh, but in the same time there are a lot of, a lot of challenges. There are a lot. Of, uh, <laughs> but coming back to uh, our uh, our initial discussion, um, you know, it's still it's still about power. Power is a single most important component because without power, it's all all this is for naught. Um, but that's the primary product in a data center. They don't even sell it based on square footage. They sell it based on power. Well, so yeah, yeah. this industry has got a lot of challenges to the point that you were saying. And I think that this is why if I try to memorialize it in a different way for those that are listening, you know, we started off with a certain amount of utilities. Right? It, it, plumbing was utility. Uh, electricity was a huge utility. You know, propane, I guess, is a home or residential utility. Um, but those two primary utilities really led us to the the what would some argue the fourth utility, which was connectivity, right? The network became the fourth utility. Now the fifth utility is what's being used to take all of those utilities prior to it and bringing Bring them, them all together, together. to I, make a, a fifth utility. And that fifth utility is a data center. A data center is the space, the power and the cooling, right? It's the primary product that is sold and it's sold based on a metric of power. And I think it's important that everyone in this industry understands when we say power is important, we mean, yeah, every decision that's made in this industry is based on what the purchase of power looks like in terms of a quantity and a density. Right. And then that equates back to everybody else in this industry. What they're going to do is going to come back to and tie back to power. How does that impact power? So I say that because I know that we're getting ready to get into some good shit here. And I want people to realize we're talking about rolling up the four previous utilities, network, or just to say three, take propane out as a home, as a regular utility. You have electricity, you have water, and you have connectivity. Okay. Yeah. Now and, we're, and, and gas. Uh, and gas. But if you roll all those up together, you create the last utility, and that's the data center, which is going to make that, that utility, once it's identified as a full utility, right. because it's compute capacity, and they understand, like, can anybody live without water and plumbing and, and flushing the toilets and electricity at their house. They they can, but it would suck. And they would suck just as bad as if you didn't have connectivity. But yeah, what is good if you have connectivity, if you don't have any compute capacity and the, abil and the ability to aggregate that technology. So I, I think that's why I really hope that people now are bought in and people are like, okay, because before it seemed like a problem for you operators or you big, large enterprise end users, use hyperscalers. That sounds like a, a problem for power. You can have to figure that shit out. Wait, we're the consumers that are putting the pressure and the demand for pent up adoption of more power. Right. So it's going to be all of our problems, not just to solve for it personally with how much we use technology, but professionally for those of us that are in this industry, this is ground zero. We're in the middle of ground zero. There's nothing more important than this and industry and the power for this absolutely industry. Absolutely right. Yes, yes. So to that end, I'm worried. I'm worried about... The fact that the only long-term scalable and sustainable and reliable form of energy I could think of is nuclear power. And I know that according to some of the people I've spoken with, we're years out. So I asked you if you get on a plane and come educate me on what we're going to do for power and what is, you've been in this industry since the beginning of it. <coughs> what are we going to be doing? What do you see this, what do you see this journey going? 
Yeah, we uh, we have to bridge that gap. Uh, you know, we we have the next five years will be difficult because we're gonna, as I said, uh, we have all these generation and transmission problems, uh, a diminishing grid in terms of uh, capacity and reliability. Uh, while the the demand continues to grow at an uh, unprecedented uh, uh, rate, so um, so what do we do? So um, you know um, we have things like hydrogen or geothermal or uh, uh, renewable or store or with storage. We have uh, um, we have the, uh, the the things like. Um, um, fuel cells or linear generators or uh, uh, recipes or turbines, uh, uh, a variety of tools um, of, uh, of uh, different technology that can bridge that gap. It's gonna be difficult uh, with most of them to, to cover this um, mega, Campuses. I mean, that's one of the one of the trend, uh, most visible trends uh, in this industry today. You s- you see these uh, um, mega campuses, one giga north of one gigawatt, so enormous piece of land. That uh, how crazy is that? Yeah, it's not a single data center. There are uh, multiple. It's a campus, uh, master plan campus, ma- like what quantum loop holes doing. There's other groups that are doing it on that's their right. own. That's right. Yeah, and but we're going to see more and more of those. Uh, uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, um, um, we have to address the um, the rest of the industry and uh, um, all the data centers which are you know. Uh, Latency sensitive. They need to be close to, to the edge. And you know, I'm sp- speaking here of um, more conventional enterprises, which this industry is still growing. It's not disappearing. And uh, we have the edge data centers that, uh, uh, as as five G becoming uh, becoming uh, ubiquitous, we're going to see more and more about that. Uh, so we have this. Uh, uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, split between uh, between mega data centers and uh, modular uh, modular data centers, smaller smaller in size. Um, plus, one plus the large the ones you'll have multiple. You have the large traditional enterprise that exists today, and it sounds like from an AI perspective, you have technically three different AI type of data centers. You have the training ones or the learning and data centers, right. and then you have the ones that are uh, federated, which are the ones that are being repurposed, right? And then the last one was one uh, inference. Okay, so those are the ones purposely and intentionally designed around a very, very high level of density. Yeah, yeah. What are we talking uh, about? Like a thousand watts? Um, well, no, no, we're not. Uh, uh, um, you're t- I assume you're talking about uh, the the GPU. Yeah, and that's I, where, that's where getting there. You know, we're at the seven fifty, and uh, it's we're going to see the the twelve hundred watt and the two thousand watt uh, in the very very near future, and and then translates into densities, uh, which uh, which are you know today they are probably uh, that's uh, uh, four. GPU, uh, NVIDIA servers, uh, each one uh, good for about 11 kilowatts or so. So uh, 40 kilowatts is uh, it's you know, you know, fairly typical, but but we're going to see uh, pretty soon uh, these numbers growing to 70, 80, 100, 100 kilowatts per cabinet. Um, and this is, as you probably know, it's driven by by latency but in by network latency in other words uh, uh, these GPUs work as a single computer and uh, uh, because of the because of uh, the fact that they because of this they have to be physically close to each other and that's why you have to have these very large densities because you cannot spread spread the uh, the, the servers uh, over a large, uh, large well, how area. big so how heavy are one of those racks i guess i mean well so you, you know, can't build even, up 10 stories i'm guessing even as in infinity uh, infinity infini band uh, uh, you know there are limitations on the, the distance so um if you if you run it a hundred kilowatts or so per cabinet, uh, um, 
you know, these are, they weight over a ton. These are rather cool cabinets, obviously. Uh, and, uh, um, and because of this uh, uh, limitation in terms of latency, we're going to start again seeing, uh, we're going to start again seeing um, multi-story uh, uh, data centers just just, just uh, uh, because we need to keep uh, all these Clusters. servers close to each other. Uh, then we're going to have to distribute water uh, to the to the cabinets, and uh, you know, ob ideally, you distribute water under the floor as opposed to on top of the cabinets, right? So uh, that means that uh, uh, maybe we're going to go back to uh, raised floor, maybe not uh, one or two feet raised floor, maybe uh, uh, six inch uh, raised floor. But what does it do? Uh, I mean, you know, you know, when you have one and a half ton cabinets on a raised floor. So that's another set of problems. So anyway, uh, we're not going to resolve all these uh, uh, high engineering issues uh, here, but uh, but uh, um, as I said, this but is- But it's iterative. There's going to be that. I'm, I'm glad that you unpeeled a few of it because everyone realizes that there's a ripple effect on everything we do in this space. You try to make an optimized design, that's going to have a ripple effect on something else. If mm -hmm. you have a means and methods in which you're going to deliver that replaces one material than another, then it's going to have limitations, right? So when we think about what we're doing, we know that whether it's, you know, manufacturing coming back to America, a lot of uh, aging or eroding current infrastructure plus with the pent of demand of growth, we're showing that we have not only big, big estimated ex uh, expectations on power demand going forward. What you started off this whole podcast with was that we exceeded our last expectations of, of projections. And there's no reason to think that the adoption rate of emerging technology is going to slow down. We'll probably continue to exceed expected plan. And this is going to lead us to whether it's like, like you said, using hydrogen and oxygen bloom fuel cells or, uh, you know, going into new markets, uh, our markets that are uh, not currently served heavy today, which means those pockets, those pockets, those non NFL cities of the United States yeah. may have stranded electrical capacity sitting on a back plane somewhere that someone could go park a, a, a large, large infrastructure campus. That's yeah, and that's, that's happening now. Yeah. Yep. But but at the end, I'm trying to get to, those are band-aids. Like you said, those are the painful things that we're going to do for the next five years, because that's going to be the painful, the painful five years, right? Where, uh, you know, generation station, like, I don't know what we're going to be doing, whether or not, uh, if it's going to go to like what Ireland's doing, which is like, yeah, you want to put a data center here, you got to be able to operate your own power plus an X amount more of that to get back to the grid if we need it. Right. So is that where we're going? And if so, how yeah. long is that? How tenable is that? How fast can we scale into that until there's a long-term solution? And I want to know, I want to know what you think the long-term solution looks like and then how many iterative options we go to, because like there was a time where you and I were talking about an ammonia option. Yeah, and it's very, uh, very much, very much there. It's just, uh, you know, you know. Let's talk about yeah, let ammonia. It, let it, and, uh, let's talk about we're hydrogen. All learn, we're Hyd all here to learn. Yeah, hydrogen. Hydrogen. Take uh, us through all the options. Yeah. You know, let's start with hydrogen. Hydrogen is uh, is really uh, um, has enormous potential, but it's complicated. It's difficult, uh, like anything else. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I come to realize after all this year is that nothing is easy in this uh, in this business. Uh, but uh, hydrogen in particular is 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 difficult. Uh, first of all, first of all, um, everybody wants green hydrogen, uh, you know, um, as opposed to gray or brown hydrogen uh, uh, that uh, um, it's made out of, uh, you know, through the conventional uh, SMR, uh, which is electrolysis uh, process uh, taking- uh, This is CalFarts, uh, which is the brown, I guess? Yeah, this is uh, steam uh, methane reformation uh, using uh, extracting the the hydrogen out of methane uh, by uh, breaking the the molecular bond between car carbon and hydrogen. Uh, so that has been used for many many years. So uh, it's a it's a mature industry, but uh, but uh, everybody wants green hydrogen, uh, hydrogen that it's carbon free. Which is uh, a bit more complicated. You can do that two ways. Uh, you can use electrolysis using uh, electric uh, using an electric current through water, 
uh, that uh, releases oxygen and hydrogen, breaks the, the, the strong molecular bond between oxygen and hydrogen in water. Um, and that's the ideal uh, situation, but it's expensive because it takes a lot of energy. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the cost of green hydrogen is two to three times higher than the cost of uh, brown or gray, uh, uh, gray hydrogen. Uh, or the other, uh, the other solution is to uh, make uh, brown hydrogen and uh, um, capture the carbon, uh, the, the byproduct of, uh, of the process, ca capture the carbon and sequestrate it uh, underground or uh, convert it into uh, um, plastic or cement or another material. So these are the, the, the two ways to do that. But um, if you look at the numbers, uh, you know, take, take the, the basic numbers. Uh, uh, it takes roughly um, 40 kilowatt hour to make one kilogram of hydrogen. And it takes about 50 kilograms of hydrogen to to make one megawatt hour of electricity. So if you work the numbers backwards, the efficiency is somewhere around 50 percent. Not spectacular, but and then um, probably the most difficult thing about hydrogen is not to manufacture hydrogen, but to transport hydrogen and to store hydrogen to a lesser extent. But to transport hydrogen, that's difficult. How do you do that? Uh, you can put in trucks, uh, not very, not, not a, a very elegant solution. Uh, you can put on ships. Um, most common, you convert it to ammonia. Uh, ammonia is uh, um, is a liquid, uh, has good density. It's relatively easy to transport. Uh, you know, we used ammonia for as a fertilizer for forever, right? Um, so um, you can we can use the same tankers that uh, move uh, oil around uh, to to move uh, uh, ammonia. But but on top of that, fifty percent. Uh, efficiency uh, to convert hydrogen to ammonia at one end and convert it back from ammonia to hydrogen at the other end consume an uh, another uh, significant amount of energy. So now the the round trip efficiency is in the 30s or so, not not the greatest efficiency in the world. Uh, but uh, um, you know it's a uh, um, that there are other options. Uh, uh, there are some interesting technologies today where uh, hydrogen is generated on premise. On, on prem, uh, uh, um, there are a number of companies. There is a company that uh, takes aluminum, scrapped aluminum, and uh, uh, through a chemical process converts that into hydrogen and alumina and heat. Uh, so there are multiple benefits of that. Uh, it's a question whether it's, this is scalable uh, to the to the level we need it, but uh, but that's that's uh, that's an option. Then uh, um, you know hydrogen can be uh, can be used not only with uh, uh, fuel cells, but in use with uh, turbines and. Uh, uh, you know, it can be used with uh, linear generators. Uh, there are. If you put them all together, like in a series or parallel with the microgrid type of platform, is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, you. Uh, um, yeah, it could be a microgrid, but it could be s simply a off-grid distributed generation option where you have one of these. Um, um, piece of equipment. What is? It could be fuel cells, could be linear generators, could be turbines, could be recips, reciprocating engines, um, and uh, whether or not they are connected to the grid, most likely they are going to be off grid. And um, you know, a lot of companies these days, because of all the things we discuss here, the uh, the uncertainty about the the reliability and quality of power, concerns about um, cyber attack and physical attacks, concern about uh, uh, about brownouts and uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, shutdowns, uh, loss of uh, loss of power altogether. So they want to have more. More control over their own power destiny. Destiny. So they want to have uh, full control of uh, of the uh, uh, power generation associated with their data centers and and other maybe their office or but primarily for for their data center because it's uh, the reliability and the uptime there is so so critical. So. Um, you see installation of these types uh, uh, um, being developed uh, all over the world, um, and. Uh, 
you know, and you have the ability to combine that with um, uh, with receptor turbines. You can uh, do what is called C- CHP, uh, combined heat power. Uh, so uh, you can use the heat, or you can uh, um, do CCHP. It's heat and uh, and uh, uh, cold. Uh, cooling, uh, uh, along with uh, with with power, um, um, you know. Another example, and there are many um, fuel cells, uh, uh, solid oxide fuel cells. These are these are um, um, base load type uh, uh, devices, as opposed to what is called PAM fuel cells, which are primarily um, uh, used for intermittent applications. Um, so these type of fuel cells uh, um, um, convert uh, electricity uh, by combining uh, hydrogen from methane with oxygen from air, and uh, um, the exhaust uh, temperature of the combination vapor and uh, some carbon uh, runs about 350 degrees C, which is good enough to uh, to run. Uh, absorption chillers. So now you have you have the ability to provide both uh, cooling and power sim- simultaneously, uh, and cooling is is practically uh, the operational cost of cooling is practically zero. So um, there are uh, there are all these options. Um, then you take a look at the, um, um, maybe uh, providing green. Uh, green hydrogen uh, is difficult, but what what about uh, what is called CC, CCS, uh, um, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, the ability to uh, to capture the the carbon at the source, whether it is the exhaust of a generator or a, a, a turbines or reciprocating engines or uh, fuel cells, capture the exhaust there. And uh, um, take the CO two and uh, bury it underground, or um, or uh, you know, deck um, uh, direct air uh, capture is another process. Um, you probably heard of uh, a company called uh, Climeworks uh, that uh, that essentially has this. There are this big machine that uh, with large fans that uh, and uh, that uh, uh, capture air in any location. Capture air and through a chemical process uh, extract the, the carbon and then take, take the carbon and um, sequestrate it somewhat, somewhat. As opposed to the difference between DAC and CCS is that DAC uh, can be located anywhere and uh, just capture uh, the carbon from from the atmosphere, which is a much smaller percentage than than the carbon that uh, is present the the exhaust of a. Um, uh, turbine, for instance. Um, so, um, um, you know, there is a lot, of, a lot of work these days in in uh, carbon capture. Sequestration is probably the most more difficult piece because uh, you need to find a uh, underground cavity uh, or use uh, uh, spent oil or gas uh, wells uh, that uh, that could be a good uh, home for uh, for this uh, CO two. Um, <clears throat> You know, ironically, some of this CO two could be used for fracking or ex- extracting, <laughs> extracting uh, oil. So, um, recycle it. Recycle it exactly. <clears throat> Can I ask a quick question? I don't want to stop you in the middle of your thing. So, I you want to keep going, or you want me to? No, go ahead. No, no, no. Well, because um, you unpackage a lot of stuff there and a lot of good things. My my thing would be these cogeneration type plants. Do you see? Uh, enterprise end users creating those like the more sophisticated ones like the you know the members of FAMGA as an example do you see um, who would be creating those types of uh, multiple generational application reliable resources like that would it be the utility providers themselves would it be the enterprise end users build them and then I don't know sell them back to the utility providers and then lease them back I don't know what, what uh, um, the answer is yes uh, both, uh, all of them. Uh, I think utilities, utilities are very much aware of this situation, and uh, they are starting to form partnership with some of these on-site generation uh, providers. Um, I think that uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, data center operators want to, they want to own the generation. Uh, 
Uh, so they build uh, they build these uh, uh, on-site generation plants, and uh, um, they they package it with uh, with the, their data center. So there was a there was a time that you had a plan where the data center itself was the biggest component of a microgrid, almost right, because it used the on the storage capacity that they already have right. from. Uh, from their emergency response type of time. I mean, like everything was already there, right? But there maybe, um, maybe it just wasn't at a medium voltage capacity where it could be plugged right into a grid. It could be, but uh, but uh, um, but you're right. It's uh, there, there is a clear um, there's uh, this uh, relationship that's it's being clearly developed between utilities and. And uh, operators, data center operators, because it, it's a synergetic relationship. Uh, if you uh, um, the the use of uh, you know demand response is becoming uh, really important because because utility need that extra capacity, even though it's not significant in terms of size, but uh, every kilowatt matters. So uh, the ability to uh, to supplement. To supplement uh, uh, what uh, the the grid can provide by using um, the uh, all the um, capacity um, from diesel generators or any other standby source, also the ability to provide frequency regulation using the batteries from uh, from the UPSs or from BES. Uh all these things are becoming more and more common, more and more popular, beneficial, uh, beneficial to the utility because it improves their reliability. Beneficial to the data center operational be op uh, operator because there are financial benefits. Of uh, uh, of doing demand response, so this uh, uh, this synergetic relationship between between these these two players is becoming more and more common in in the in the in the industry. Do you see it <clears throat> adopting at a different rate in other countries more so than others? Like maybe some countries are more heavily regulated, or they just already have a higher adoption rate of this type of uh, program or project set. I mean, well, uh, yeah, you can bring up a good point. Uh, um, um, this industry has not been been heavily regulated historically, uh, but things are changing right now. Um, primarily in Europe, there is a lot more regulation there. Uh, a good example is uh, heat reuse, which is becoming becoming is going to become mandatory. What is uh, it again? Heat reuse. Okay. So uh, find a way to uh, use all the, the the heat generated by the data center, which is right now just wasted. Uh, find a way to capture, capture that. it and use it. And um, you know, heat um, greenhouse farming. Greenhouse farming, or uh, or um, a school, or university, or. Um, um, apartment complex obviously uh if there is a central heating uh, in the general vicinity it makes it much easier um sometimes especially if you have uh this large data center in the middle of nowhere uh it's very difficult to find uh practical ways to uh, uh to uh, reuse this uh, this heat but it's becoming it's becoming mandatory uh in uh, in Europe and is a provision there that uh, essentially says uh, uh, you shall do heat reuse unless you there is a, a, unless there is no practical way of doing it, which is <laughs> a way of getting out of it. But but uh, uh, I, I'm I'm sure that uh, uh, some of this uh, uh, regulation will uh, transition to uh, to this country, and now we're going to see more and more requirement, primarily driven by um, by the uh, decarbonization by by the uh, uh, the right. whole um, sustainability and carbon reduction pressure. <clears throat> what if uh, so? I mean, there's a lot, a lot that we're going through, and I'm bouncing all over the place because I'm asking you all kinds of different questions based on my own curiosity. You know, from the operator's perspective, and you know, it's funny because earlier you were talking about you're like, hey, you know, there was a time when you were when you founded EYP prior to being acquired by HP, it had done like you know. 40% of all the work in this industry worldwide, you know, and, and to this day, I would say your reach and your influence on the industry has grown even greater to where, um, everybody that's holding a cell phone right now, uh, probably touches, um, in their, their 
usage as a consumer from eyeball content or videos or whatever they're uploading or downloading or e-commerce. Um, I would say that there's a 75% chance they've touched a, a data center that you've had an influence over or touched, you know, by, you know, consulting or advising for the businesses. As you advise for these operators, how, how uh, willing are they right now to invest into their own grid solutions versus relying on some local utility? To, to be able to tell them what their capabilities or limitations are going to be. Do you, how far are we from nuclear? How far are we from uh, hydrogen? And how far are we from everything between hydrogen and fission or fusion? And how far are we from operators uh, doing what the enterprise groups may be already doing? And that is investing millions of dollars into uh, a part of their portfolio that'll allow them to future proof and scale to a large, you know, like gigawatt size. Mm -hmm. But you're asking about a lot of dollars right now. And those infrastructure real estate asset groups that are investing into, you know, 10, 12, 13 year, you know, highway programs and projects, like even they may have a hard time waiting in those investment portfolios or those investment thesis, right? Because there's a lot of high stakes poker going on where everyone's land grabbing to the final pieces of space power and cooling they could build on but uh in the next five years from now it'll the whole country will be picked through and all of the best places we could go to we'll have solved for on a latency basis and we still didn't solve the long-term power problem well look um you know uh, i i don't want to sound alarmist of, uh, or <laughs> the sky is not necessarily falling but uh, uh like any any business eventually the the uh, the supply will catch up with demand. Uh, um, in this industry, because of uh, because of uh, the the relatively long period of time until you build the infrastructure, uh, things will not happen overnight. It's going to take so probably the next five to ten years. Will uh, you know we're going to continue to see this this growth, this uh, incredible growth uh, for, for the uh, foreseeable future. But but let's face it, it's a race. Uh, um, Everybody is trying to grab uh, as much power and uh, land right now, and, and labor, uh, and labor, yeah, right, and equipment, and uh, and uh, um, um, and uh, you know whoever is going to uh, have more to deliver. You know, <laughs> it's it's a difficult time for uh, uh, for on both sides uh, the um, the occupancy rate the uh, of data centers the. Uh, the capacity uh, is in the ninety eight percent, ninety seven, yeah, ninety eight percent. Almost no product out there. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to to find a uh, ten or twenty megawatt chunk available anywhere. I mean, this will change. There is an enormous amount of construction going on, uh, but uh, but it's uh, it's it's difficult, and uh, and uh, uh, pretty much everything uh, that's being built is already sold already. It seems uh, like yeah, and uh, uh, right now, uh, um, if you can if you can get uh, uh, twenty megawatts or uh, thirty megawatts uh, by. Uh, by the end of 2025, it's uh, it's 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 a good thing. Most of it, most of the stuff is going to come online in 2026. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, uh, there are there are many other components uh, of this of this space that uh, are evolving. Uh, you know, we can take uh, renewable, for instance. Uh, there is so much uh, so much going on uh, in renewables. Uh, um, Let's but, talk about it. Like scratch the paint with that. What is going on? Like, do you see solars being the renewable champion that we're gonna? Yeah, renewable. Yeah, yeah it's uh, uh, the the cost of renewable or solar has been dropping at uh, about eleven percent a year uh, for the last ten years or so. Which is uh, right now. Granted, there are some uh, incentives, but uh, but still, it's cheaper than the the uh, electricity generated by coal or uh, nuclear. Uh, but but once again, uh, and uh, uh, wind is also uh, dropped at a rate of about five percent a year, which are tremendous uh, reduction in in cost of electricity. This is uh, uh, levelized cost of electricity, obviously. Um, but uh, but unless we resolve the the storage. 
uh, issue. Uh, uh, we're gonna again. We're gonna it get doesn't to, matter to, how sunny the days are, how windy the days are. Yeah, but we're getting to a point of diminishing returns. Uh, we're gonna we, we're having too much power uh, a few hours a day and uh, no power at all uh, the rest of the of the day unless we have the ability to store that uh, excess energy and then release it uh, uh, during the off hours. Uh, uh, and that's a difficult thing uh, because. Uh, um, Chemical batteries are still expensive, although there is an enormous uh, amount of work there. And uh, uh, like anything else, there are some progress, some uh, some dramatic progress. Uh, I'm fascinated by the, the things I see there. Um, obviously, the, the the chemical batteries industry is primarily driven by the EV industry. Uh, as a lot more than than the stationary business, uh, the, the, our business. Um, but still, uh, the uh, the the um, innovation and the development done by the auto manufacturers, the battery manufacturers, will translate into progress for. Uh, for uh, stationary applications, and uh, we have this, you know, um, let's take um, you know so a good example would be uh, the difference between the traditional uh, lithium-ion battery and the new solid-state battery. Uh, a typical, a typical uh, um, lithium-ion conventional um, LFE. LFE is is the newer version of lithium-ion battery, which is. Um, have a bit lower density, but uh, but it's much safer. It doesn't have the the tendency to <laughs> uh, to go Explode. up in, to go up in flames like uh, so like dangerous. we had we had some data centers happening uh, because of uh, <coughs> lithium ion batteries. So um, so LFEs are uh, uh, most common batteries right now, but uh, we are seeing a, a a very interesting development on solid state batteries. Uh, uh, which uh, uh, will, uh, you know, uh, a, a new type of battery will have a, a density of maybe uh, 500 watt hour per kilogram uh, versus uh, your, your best uh, conventional lithium ion battery, which is um, maybe 260, somewhere in the 260, oh, 250, 200. Oh. Yeah, double. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, it's a new technology for, uh, uh, it uses uh, uh, lithium instead of graph, uh, graphite for uh, uh, for the anode. It has a different, a different configuration of the cathode, and, but primarily the electrolyte. Uh, it's either solid or semi-solid. Some of these uh, uh, Chinese batteries that are, <coughs> uh, are using uh, um, um, a semi-solid uh, electrolyte, which uh, which uh, a makes them much safer and uh, improves the, the the energy density of the battery. For me, uh, the more exciting uh, thing uh, uh, in, in this domain is uh, what is called graphene. Uh, graphene is this god material that uh, uh, it's a carbon-based material that has a thickness of one atom and is stronger than steel. You called it god material? Where did we find this? <laughs> Captain America drop with it? I mean, like, where do we get this? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a new material that... Uh, uh, that uh, you know, uh, the example I like to use is uh, uh, you take one sheet of graph uh, graphene and lay it over 12 tennis courts, and the weight of uh, that sheet of uh, graphene is less than one gram. <coughs> so uh, when you when uh, the material is so thin, Very you light. can you can build. Uh, Ultra capacitor, super capacitors that have enormous, enormous surface, and you, as you very well know, the uh, energy density of a capacitor is a function of uh, uh, a number of factors, but the most important is surface. The larger the surface between anode and cathode, the the, uh, uh, the, the higher. So now. We are not there yet. It's going to take a while, but uh, we have the, uh, the the potential of bridging this gap between power density and energy density. We we can, uh, uh, you know, batteries uh, are energy devices. They they store a lot of energy, but they are 
they're kind of sluggish. Uh, uh, they, they don't deliver uh, power uh, uh, very quickly, as opposed to capacitors, and especially ultra capacitors, which, which can deliver a lot of power, but only for a very short uh, period of time. So finding a way to, uh, to build a capacitor that also has significant energy density. Now we're talking about a, a uh, uh, totally transformational uh, uh, solution to, to energy storage. Is that the solution you think for storage? The, like, uh, are those like just big no, inverter? No, I think, no, no, I, I, I don't, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the sodium ion batteries, uh, which is, which is a very viable alternative to lithium ion batteries. Um, they, they have a lot of advantages. They, they have lower energy density than lithium ion, uh, but they are cheaper and, uh, a, uh, um, kilowatt hour of, um, um, sodium ion battery is somewhere around $75 right now versus $135. That's a, the lower cost for lithium ion. So it's about half. Yeah. Uh, Real money. Uh, so uh, that's a, that's a uh, big advantage. Are any of these being built in the United States or is it all being built in like Korea or China? Um, you know, China... China is the big, uh, big kahuna when it comes to, uh, uh, you know. Smelting and building batteries. Uh, K, cattle, uh, CATL is the largest manufacturer and there are some uh, uh, BYU, uh, uh, um, BYD, uh, there are big, big manufacturers. They are primarily driven once in, uh, by EV, but, uh, but as I said, uh, some of these batteries are starting to use for, uh, um, for, uh, uh, stationary application, but um, I believe that what we need at grid level, or or to support to support uh, a, a mega data centers, we're going to need a different type. Uh, uh, we need uh, storage that will uh, will be able to store gigawatts or hundreds of megawatts of energy for days, even weeks. I mean, this is what we really need to uh, to strengthen to stabilize and uh, uh, strengthen the, the Is there grid. anybody working on this? Yeah, sure, they are. Uh, I think that uh, there, there is uh, there is a a um, solution using uh, compressed air. There are some I've installations that, that uh, were is not that very successful. Who, who created that one? Uh, there are several. There are s several. S some of them are used. Uh, they, they haven't been all that successful, but there are some uh, new companies that uh, uh, Several companies that do uh, that are develop this technology. Uh, once again, you have to have fairly large underground storage. You can you can store it above ground in uh, in containers, but uh, but uh, it's it's more expensive and uh, you don't store that much energy. But if you find and, and there are you know I looked at the map of the United States, there are enormous number of cavities like this all over the country. Texas has a lot of them. Uh, Where we can just convert California. them into storage and facilities. Storage, yeah, yeah. You, you compress the air. It has to be, uh, 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 it's not a, just a, a simple uh, storage. I get it. Uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that, but uh, but it has the ability to release uh, uh, and uh, the uh, the COE, the levelized cost of energy is very low. It's very, very low so compared to uh, to chem uh, chemical batteries. And there are some other type of batteries. So, uh, you know, there are the flow batteries. Uh, uh, there are the liquid metal batteries. There are the glass batteries. There are other kind of batteries uh, out there. But for grid level applications, I, I, I believe that we have to go beyond chemical batteries. Do you think that... Uh you're talking about like mineral battery or, or but or will there be limitations to those resources for those types of batteries? Um, um, well, if it's uh, the uh, uh, the air compressed air, obviously not. Uh, I mean, it's an exp it's an expensive installation. I mean, it, uh, sure, cost hundreds of millions of dollars to to build uh, um, a gigawatt uh, uh, storage facility like this, um, but. Um, um, yeah, the lithium ion batteries are uh, uh, expensive, uh, and uh, and uh, lithium is uh, you know at one point uh, the cost of lithium uh, 
a couple of years ago. Uh, you bought silver or something like that? It was uh, close to about $80,000 per ton. Uh, now it dropped to maybe 37,000, but but still. Uh, and uh, this has geopolitical implications yeah. because there are only a few countries in the world that- uh, Right, that, uh, that's what uh, I was asking. Have, yeah, yeah. Now we so, start talking about reasons for conflict with other so, nations. So that's why there is a, a renewed interest in the sodium ion batteries. Uh, Natron is a, uh, an American company that uh, that uh, makes a very very promising product. <clears throat> what what are we waiting on then for this? The, the theoretically the technology is available. You know, I mean, you were talking earlier about helium. Uh, I'm sorry, um, hydrogen. Right. And it's obviously an, an application of technology that's been around for a long time. Have you seen a lot of growth in? You've been in this industry for 25 years. Um, I would imagine if I sat down and asked you things that you would have predicted 25 years ago, you know, surprisingly enough, you know, I, I, I would imagine 50 percent of that stuff. You'd be like, "Yeah, I would have assumed this is where we would be." The no, other. I, I wouldn't have predicted anything. You wouldn't have. No. Uh, first of all, I'm not smart enough to do that. And secondly, uh, it's so different than uh, than uh, than what anybody expected. Uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> so to that end. Is there anything that you've seen in innovation in the last 10 to 15 years, not even 25 since this industry started, where, where you've seen something that would give you comfort in thinking that we're making progress or we're on the right path to seeing hydrogen being able to be used on a commercial basis and an economically efficient commercialized basis? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, and we're years uh, away from that? You know there are there are a number of projects uh, financed by the uh, IRA program, the, the uh, Inflation uh, Reduction Act. Um, these are uh, um, these big hydrogen hubs. Uh, one of them is in the north northwest. I looked at uh, um, it will generate about five hundred metric tons a day of hydrogen. Uh, will have something like 6,000 metric tons of storage, uh, uh, stored hydrogen, cryogenically most likely. Um, you know, as I said before, the, the most difficult thing about hydrogen is transportation. It's not, uh, so uh, here, um, you know, hydrogen is used for the space shuttle, industry. rockets. The, the the largest use of hydrogen is steel industry and cement industry. Ironically, uh, so um, with a hub like this, uh, um, the plan there is to build about five hundred or six hundred uh, miles of dedicated piping going d directly to a number of. Uh, users of uh, enterprise that uh, use large amounts of, uh, of hydrogen. And uh, this would be green hydrogen uh, uh, adjacent to the hydrogen hub. They're going to have a large uh, solar plant and they're going to have some wind and they're going to have some hydro in the Northwest. So, uh, so you know, this is... Uh, this is very exciting. You know, you can transport hydrogen by injecting into into the natural gas pi uh, 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 pipeline. Into uh, you cannot do more than maybe thirty percent because beyond that you have corrosion. It's heavier than no. It's a pro uh, it's corroding the pipes. Okay. Uh, um, so. Uh, um, you, you can either use uh, the the mixture of methane and hydrogen uh, by by doing that you reduce the uh, the, the carbon content uh, or you can you can extract it at the other end uh, using a special filter that will uh, extract the hydrogen at the uh, 99 percent uh, purity so you can use that uh, at the other end but uh, so uh, these are some some uh, some options another option uh, you know, nobody looked at that in the past but now uh, the world is starting to look at extracting hydrogen from underground uh, nobody looked at hydrogen stored uh, like uh, like natural gas but but there are ra there are reserves of hydrogen Hydrogen uh, sitting uh, in uh, um, in pockets uh, underground, and uh, what's the chances there? Those pockets are close to where we build data centers today. <laughs> uh, uh, this this whole thing is also very new. Uh, sure. uh, there are a number of enterprises that uh, are uh, starting to look for it. 